two more minutes, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think we're ready to start. Michael? Yes. Please. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the World Association of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology webinar, The Evolution of Tracheobronchial Stenting, a tribute to Dr. Jean-Francois Dimon, uh, dedicated to one of the founding fathers of interventional pulmonology and the pioneer of stenting. My name is Pasoe Popevich. I'm assistant professor at Belgrade University and head of interventional pulmonology unit in clinical center of Serbia in Belgrade, Serbia. Before we start, I would like to point out that this is the second of the World Association of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology webinar series. And the World Association is now responding to the increasing need of knowledge for bronchoscopy in the context of current COVID pandemic and its aftermath. World leaders are ready to provide their evidence-based recommendations for the current and future practice of bronchoscopy. And our goal is sharing not just mere opinions, but also experiences, assuring the best results of these procedures in any country and in any medical environment. We, and uh, all this without exposing patients and co-workers uh, to the burden of doctors without the proper training in a new worldwide context. We are opening this webinar by memories of Dr. Dimon's closest friends and associates. Please, Michael, play the video. the beyond, where you're resting in peace, I'm sure you are proud of the accomplished daddy. Indeed, you have teach so many pulmonologists in the field of bronchoscopy and stenting. As you know, sir, at the present time, we are trying to perpetuate this technique in Marseille. May this satisfy you. Be respectful and devoted to the best story. Jean-François Dimon was the Leonardo da Vinci of the rigid bronchoscopy, a genius designed the safest bronchoscope and incredible tools to perform treatments in the target bronchial tree in order to improve the quality of the patient's lives. It was a honor for me to have him as a mentor and as a friend for almost 40 years. His greatest uh, teaching to me was uh, his uh, willingness to teach in an easy way, and I tried to do it. We are going to miss him for a long time. We are very sad hearing that our friend Jean-François Dumont has passed away. I had the privilege to know him for almost 40 years by now as an ingenious inventor and pioneer in interventional oncology as inspiring colleague and friend. He was a gifted teacher for legions of physicians and founder of a worldwide school for interventional pulmonologists. 
He was a true philanthropist and had a wide range of interests apart from his professional life, such as sailing, wine cultivating and Egyptian hieroglyphs. We will always remember him in our hearts as a great example and an inspiration to follow in his footsteps. Thank you, Michael. Uh, nobody knew Dr. Dimon better than his mentee and closest uh, friend and associate. Dr. Elf Dito, a mentee perspective of a mentor, a journey with Dr. Dimon. Please proceed with your lecture. Hmm. Michael, oh, sorry. Can you see my slides now? Uh, Let's see. No, not yet. This one. Okay. You have, you have the slides Perfect. now? Perfect. Yeah. Yes. So, well, thank you, Spazoye. Um, of course, I'm very happy. I'm delighted. I'm honored to be here, even if it's a bit sad for me <laughs> to, to, to always mention about uh, Dr. Jean François Dumont. But, and my talk won't be, uh, even though the webinar is dedicated to tracker bronchial stenting, my talk won't be dedicated to that, even though I will mention, of course, a bit of, uh, of tracker bronchial stenting. But what I want to say, I, what I want to present is uh, what I think, what I feel of Dr. Dumont. So I will divide my presentation into four parts. I will speak about the, the part that I think most of the people know, the physician part. I want to say a few words about the man, about him and me, and what we, we have as a legacy from him. So uh, Jean-François Dumont was born in Marseille. He was the son of two chest physicians. One was more interested in, in lung function, physiology. Uh, was the, the other one in endoscopy and also tuberculosis at that time. Uh, and rapidly, his major interest for bronchoscopy came, and all the rated areas of uh, close to, to, to endoscopy, like thoracic surgery, lung transplantation, and uh, so he started he started doing uh, bronchoscopy, like you see in the in the, in the picture on the on the left side, uh, in the hospital Salvator. Salvator is a small hospital in the south of Marseille, and rapidly he moved to. St. Marguerite Hospital, and everybody, everybody remembers the, the name of St. Marguerite Hospital. And you see in the red circle, the, the part of the hospital where he was located. And, and, the, and this part was called the Centre Laser, laser so Laser Center, uh, because, because of course he was one of the pioneers, we, we see it again in laser. But laser was uh, also proposed for uh, skin disease at that time in this, uh, in this unit. So uh, Dr. Jean-Paul Dumont is very famous because uh, in, in the 80th century, uh, past century, when the flexible bronchoscope arrived, was invented by Igedo, Igedo Shikeda, we, a lot of people thought that the rigid bronchoscope will be abandoned. But he, he really believes that uh, the rigid bronchoscope was very essential tool in therapeutic bronchoscopy. So he was one of the uh, one of the physicians who was still doing radio bronchoscopy in Europe, in Europe, like in Germany also, in Heidelberg, for instance. And you see on these pictures the way he was doing radio bronchoscopy. First, you have to notice that he was seated. He was seated. Uh, I, I, I was taught to, to do radio bronchoscopy seated, but now I feel more comfortable when, when I stand up. But that's a particularity. You see that the patient was, uh, uh, was ventilated with a balloon. It was balloon assisted ventilated and uh, no jet ventilation, no, no, no ventilator. And he, he, he had the tendency also to, 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 to look directly in the, in the optic rather than putting a camera uh, also. So uh, the idea for him was because he, he found that um, the image, you, you have a better appreciation of, of the depth 
of, of the endoscopic view when he was looking directly in the, in the, in, in the optic. Then he's famous for laser because he was also one of the pioneers to do laser, at least in France, uh, with another center in Paris, uh, laser. Uh, and at that time he, he used uh, YAG laser. You see the, all, all the different laser on the light spectrum. And um, he started doing laser thanks to the fiber, uh, fiber uh, laser fiber, sorry, that could be uh, inserted in the broccoscope. Uh, with the YAG laser. And at that time, the YAG laser was so big, so big that, uh, sorry, I want to show you something. Uh, you see here on, on, on this uh, um, photograph, there is a room behind, behind him. And the, la the laser was so big that he was in this room and only one arm was passing through the window with, uh, with uh, the fiber. Uh, so he wrote books on laser and not only laser, you have the, the, the French French book, but there is also an English version of, of this book uh, with all the how to use laser, the, I would say the 10 commandments of, uh, of laser, of laser procedure. Uh, and of course, is very famous, and this is one of the topic of uh, the, to the main topic of the webinar for uh, stenting. He is a father, he is in invented the first uh, andolminal stents commercially available silicon stud, uh, silicon stents. As you can see, very simple idea, just a tube with studs around to prevent migration. He played the first one in 19, uh, 1987 for uh, tracheal stenosis, benign tracheal stenosis, and he did the first publication in chest uh, in 1990. So what he really gave us, if we have to summarize the legacy of Dr. Dumont as a physician, it's a triptych, rigid bronchoscope, laser, and stent. Because with this triptych, that means that you could treat symptomatic malignant or benign central airway obstruction disease, or eventually to seal fistula that were before considered as, I would say, non-curable or eventually treat treatable with uh, extensive and prohibitively uh, difficult surgery. So that's very uh, the legacy of Dr. Dumont, the triptych, laser, really bronchoscope and stents. What I think a lot of people know is that Dr. Dumont was a very easy sharing teacher. Uh, so he, he used to welcome a lot of people in the Centre Lazare of Marseille. Uh, at that time, even people from abroad would do procedures on patients, which is now completely forbidden. Uh, when you want to, to come to, to Marseille now, it's only as observer. Uh, we can only teach uh, people now when they have a, say a contract, a real official contract between uh, the two institutions, the institution of the, of the trainee and our institution. But Dr. Dumont was very easy sharing teacher. And he, won, he was one of the first to do a broccoscopy course with live cases, live cases. And you see uh, in this slide, the man who is close to the camera is, is, is Dr. Dumont's son, is Gérard Dumont. Gérard Dumont used, used to, to do all the transmission of the uh, live cases of his father, and he's still doing that for me uh, when I do my courses. So the, Dr. Dumont was doing cases in the operating room, and they were transmitted in the amphitheater where all the attendees were gathered and uh, could, could share, could talk, and ask questions during the procedure. Uh, he, he trained uh, in the first 10 years uh, because Marseille was at that time the only referral and training center. He, he, he trained, so of course there was someone knocking at the door, of course. Uh, uh, he, he, he trained people first in France and also in Europe and in the world. And all these guys became leaders in the world in the in the, in, the, in the IP association like Jean-Michel Vergniaud in France, we heard Pablo Diaz Jiménez from from Spain who become became the leader in, in Spain. Julius Jensen in uh, in uh, in Netherlands, and record John Bimis, Eric Kedel, Tapse, John Arrow, and of course in Japan too Miyazawa and Watanabe came to Marseille uh, uh, for training. Uh, everybody knows about. 
uh, these uh, posters, um, uh, almost all the IP units have this kind of posters on the wall. But you have to remember that they have been uh, they have been done by Dr. Dumont and also Professor Fuentes, uh, the thoracic surgeon in Marseille. Uh, again, Dr. Dumont loved anatomy and he wanted to share that with uh, with others. So this poster was was uh, edited by uh, the American Chest uh, uh, Association, Association in 1984. Again, you see this nice drawing in the nice books that, that he did on radio bronchoscopy, laser, stenting, uh, very uh, useful uh, images to, to have an idea about what to do in, in the airway with a radio bronchoscope. Here you have, in 2003, he did the, his, his farewell course uh, before, just before retirement, and you have in videos his last radio bronchoscopy. I let, uh, I let you hear. I see that uh, all my, uh, my team is coming. Thank you very much. Oh. It was his last. <laughs> His last, his last uh, bronchoscopy, so in November 2003, and you have the picture of him uh, and all his team. He was very touched by, and he was surprised by the fact that all the people came in the opening, uh, in the operating room. So it was in 2003. Now, uh, to what about the man? He was born in Marseille in 1939, but but his family owned a big house, as you can see here, uh, in, in, within a wine, wine yard in, in, a, in a small town called Cassis. But very nice, very nice place, very rich place too. So uh, a big house, big, big family house with wines. And, and the family is producing wines. It could be white, uh, rosé, or, or red. So quite good. Three children, two daughters and one son. One daughter is chess physician also in a small town close to Nice, seven grandsons and one dog, as you can see on the, on the picture. Uh, I think that uh, uh, in the video, introduction video, people talk about is, is the fact that Dr. Dumont had a lot of patients. And I would say uh, his main patient was for the sea and both sailing, sailing. He had a big boat and he even did races uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. I remember once he came to a, a Congress in Barcelona uh, by boat. So I, I, I remember that. And, but in fact, he was passionate for life in general. And of course, when you're passionate for life, you hate death. That's, uh, that's uh, the conclusion of that. And, and I, I just can tell you that he died uh, in July 2020, he died suddenly. Uh, and and knowing him, I think that's a, really the kind of death he would have uh, uh, wished for, for him. So, what I, if I had to, 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 to list the qualities and even the drawbacks of Dr. Dumont, I would say that it was a strange mix between humility and strength, strong conviction. For him, things were black or white. No, there was no 50 shades of gray. No, it's white or black. Uh, but he, he was very reserved too. Um, uh, he, he kind of bare in his cave, you know, from time to time, you know, he was, he was very reserved. He was very demanding for himself and for the others, very meticulous, kind and polite. And, and everybody can tell that he was very faithful in friendship. Uh, Enrich Becker mentioned the fact that even after retirement, he, he, he continued to have uh, activities and which is a bit, a bit strange, but he created an application for, to translate hieroglyphic Egyptian to French. So well, I don't know if it's really useful, but, uh, but uh, he did that because he, he was passionate, passionate with that. And I think more people know his uh, website, Bronco Training, which is still, I think, active. Uh, we, and he did it that with, uh, with FR Company. FR Company is a company which is producing the FR bronchoscope, uh, the Dumont Ridge bronchoscope. Now, a few words about uh, him and me. 
during my training, I've been resident just for six months in the laser center in 1994. And honestly, I, of course, I was completely uh, worship, uh, worshiping him. You know, it's, <laughs> I was in admiration. What, what he did was completely amazing. But clearly, at that time when I was resident, I have no idea that I could do that in my life in the future. So I went to general pulmonology, and I was doing that when I received a phone call in uh, early 2001. So the phone call said, hello, Hervé. Uh, yes. Uh, would you like to replace me? Say, yeah. With that, uh, I, oh, sorry, it's Dr. Dumont, because Dr. Dumont has a tendency not to present himself. So it's, you, you have to, to guess. And, uh, I say, oh, it's a bit uh, sudden and strange, but uh, yes. <laughs> and I said, yeah, very, very fast. And so uh, I, I will say a few words about my Jedi training in, in, from 2001 to, to November 2003, the legacy, and a few words uh, after. So the Jedi training, you, re you recognize the Yoda, Master Yoda, and you recognize me and Dr. Dumont with more hair than we have now. Uh, why I say just Jedi training because because of laser laser center, and um, and so I I did my training within only two years, and the deal was that I had to acquire competency in therapeutic bronchoscopy. I had to be very skilled in rigid, and uh, the the deal was that I I was in the operating room. He was in his desk, and I I, I had to call him only if I had a problem. So, well, with pride, you know, uh, I was proud. So I really try to, to disturb him the less. But if I, if I had to list three sentences I remember from him during this training is this three, three sentences. If it looks nice, better the clinical result will be. So for him, he was convinced that the, if the, uh, the result at the end of the procedure was nice, you know, aesthetically nice, then the, the clinical out, out, outcome would be better. And I also remember uh, the first time I, I placed my uh, my first voice stent, I was very excited. I came to his desk and I say, ah, Dr. Dumont, I put my first voice stent. And he said, well, okay, but did you make a movie of that? The, no, no, I was too, too concentrated on the, on the procedure. So, so I don't care. If you can show me, if you can teach someone, it's not interesting. And the last sentence is, you'll be a real international bronchoscopist once you will have to face a massive hemorrhage during the procedure and you of course you'll be successful uh, in managing that so the other part of the training was that i had to implement the techniques in the in the in marseille because dr dumont was very interested in therapeutic bronchoscopy but not very, not that interested in diagnostic procedures so i had to uh, to to import to marseille autofluorescence even tbna which was not done in marseille at that time ebus cryotherapy so uh, I went a few months to Philadelphia and visiting my friend Ali Mousani. And also I've been to Boston, uh, Beth Israel Medical Center to, 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 to meet uh, uh, Amin Ernst. And during the two years, he, we, we've been to Congress uh, all together, like uh, I would say, to expose the air to international congresses. First one was uh, in, in Spain with uh, uh, the Congress is from uh, Pablo Diaz Jimenez in CGS. That was a very, very nice uh, part of the, of the training. Uh, then he left and I had to continue to teach and spread the knowledge in real microscopy and I was tenting. And believe me that in 2005, when, when the recommendation of the AD FDA came into the market where only, uh, I mean, at least you can, you have to, to avoid using metallic stent in benign airway disorder, and you have to consider uh, silicon stent placement and of course surgery. At that time, I received a lot of requests from, from America, from, <laughs> from centers in America to train rigid, to, to, be, to be taught in, uh, in, in rigid bronchoscopy and silicon stent placement. And all this guy came at that time um, from Europe and uh, most of them became also leaders in the country, like David Brin in, in Ireland, uh, Levendala in Turkey, Milena Ancheva, uh, also uh, Luisero in Spain. And look at the list of American guys who came at that time Ali Mousseni, Momen Waidi, Carla Lam, Michael Matruzak, Cleveland, Andrew Haas, Issam Shaheen, Gaetan Michaud, 
Francisco Almeida, Alan Broca, all these guys. And more interesting, not, not more interesting, but also interesting is that also countries, the more exotic also came uh, like Costa Rica, Ecuador, Malaysia, Vietnam, Senegal, and the first Indian invasion uh, uh, with some guys, you know, Ravin Rameta, Patabi Rahman, who became friends. Uh, but India started to be reinterested in rigid at that time. Uh, more trainees. Now, now we have very, very few people coming from uh, Northern America, except from Canada, because they speak French, most of them, from the French part. So we, we can have them in the team and they can be part of the, of, of the staff, uh, really, uh, like any one of us, Switzerland, Portugal, uh, Senegal, Mali, Costa Rica, South Korea, Thailand, Turkey. All these guys are, are we'll say, and, and girls became friends. And still some Indian guys, uh, Julien, who is also trained now uh, in, in, in our center. Remember that also at all. Uh, the, the editorial, we, we, you asked me to write with Dr. Dumont when we were waiting at, uh, at Belgrade airport uh, three years ago for the 30th birthday of the airway stenting in, in Marseille. So I think that this, this editorial is very interesting because we have really, really summarized all we think about, about stenting. And that's, uh, uh, and, and, and Dr. Dumont signed it too. He signed it too. And, and one of the conclusions is that the best, the ideal stent is the one you don't place. So, so it's just because we want to push the airway stenting, but we, 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 we want to say that if you place a stent, you have to reconsider re re that as a palliation. Uh, now, very rapidly, the fact that even after retirement, we have still done congresses all together with Dr. Dumont, like one of the nicest congress in Kyoto. One, in, in, in Florence, in Italy, in 2016. And we drove from Marseille to Florence, uh, Dr. Dumont, myself, and Rachid Tazi. And Rachid Tazi now is working with Tony Rosel. Tony Rosel has a tendency to, 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 to take all, my, all the guys I trained. <laughs> and, and the last, probably the last con Congress Dr. Dumont did in 2018 in Denver. And you see the picture with Ali Moussani. So rapidly again, we, we, are, we were still friends. I consider him as a, my spiritual father. He came to my, to my wedding uh, and, and to my birthday, 50th birthday. And uh, from, um, sadly, uh, uh, in July 2020, so I received a phone call from, from uh, uh, his, his daughter telling me that he was suddenly de de death. Uh, he, she asked me to be the link between the family and, and the scientific world. So I had to, to, to spread the news, uh, the news of his death, of his passing. I, and I was also very honored and proud to be part of his family. I was invited to his funeral. And believe me, it was probably the most difficult speech of my life. Uh, just because he had a big sense of humor, uh, Dr. Dumont. I was in China, in, 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 in Guangzhou once. And I, I, I was visiting a temple and, and I found this statue. I said, wow, but it's Dr. Dumont, it's him. Uh, so the God of Broncoscopy has already a statue. I just had to add some fake glasses and it looks really like uh, Dr. Dumont. So the legacy of Dr. Dumont, I mean, is still living, is still in all of us, all, all of the guys you see on, on, this, uh, on these slides. And uh, it's, of course, very living for me because this year I received uh, the, the, the prize uh, with his name, I, I, and I have it here. That's a huge medal, huge medal. And probably, thanks to him, we will organize the next World Congress in, uh, for, of Broncology. The, the, the dates have changed. It's not in April, but it will be in October 2022. So now I just have to say, that if I had to summarize Dr. Dumont with one sentence, I would say that it's not because things are impossible that we don't dare, it's because we don't dare that things are impossible. Uh, I would say also that uh, uh, another, sentence, uh, uh, another sentence is that he didn't know it was impossible, so he did it. This is probably what can summarize Dr. Dumont. So thank you for everything and rest in peace. And if you can spare a bottle of your wine, for our next meeting, because I hope we'll, we'll do. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Harvey. It was great. Thank you, Harvey, for this uh, really valuable and uh, emotional insight in the life of uh, such great men. And uh, now uh, we need to know how do silicon stents uh, hold in everyday practice, especially in malignant terrorist stenosis. We expect, uh, we expect answer from our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Antonio Rossell from Barcelona, one of the leading European interventional pulmonologists. Please, Tony. Thank you for your kind words. And I'm going to share my yeah. screen. Um, can you see my slides? Um, do you? Yes. Can we clear it? Okay. Thank you. It's an uh, absolute honor uh, to be here and participate in this session dedicated to Professor Nimbo, a real giant of interventional pulmonology. I would like to thank the WAVIP board for inviting me. My talk will be focused on the silicon stands versus fully covered metal stands in our daily practice. Okay, um, yes, uh, I have a conflict of interest. As a matter of fact, uh, it's because uh, Pablo Diaz was my mentor, and as uh, you said, Ray, and uh, Dr. Dumont was his mentor. So in a way, I can consider Dr. Dumont my grand mentor. So uh, yes, it, it's a kind, a kind of uh, emotional conflict of interest. Well, the story begins in the 80s, and we uh, use, or they use, this uh, endovascular stance. The idea was good, but the results in the mid and, and short and mid term were uh, not optimal. So that's what, what this paper is so important in the 90s, where for the first time, a stand uh, specially designed for the uh, tracheobronchial tree uh, was uh, um, launched. That's why the title says it's a dedicated tracheobronchial stand. And um, well, during the last year, some changes were made. The, the, the metal stands have uh, had an evolution to this partially covered and the straight uh, silicon stand went to this bifurcated stands. And what about this century? Well, the metal stands uh, continued to evolve to this fully covered, and also the uh, white stands were fully covered. So in a way, they were resembling to the gold standard that was the uh, Dumont stand. What do they have in common? Well, we can consider them the first generation of trunk and brown gill stands. So all of them have this chiver shape, and the only uh, for the only action they do on the airway is this expansive radial force. Nothing else happens. There are differences between one and the other. Uh, as you may see, all the silicon stands are uh, not softer as the metallic stands. So with the same force, you achieve uh, another more ex uh, more compression. There are differences in anchorage systems. For the silicon stands, you need this stat, the stats, and also some radial force. For the partially uh, covered metal stands, you need this, the ends to be embed, embedded in the mucosa, and also some external radial force. And for the fully covered, it's uh, this uniform expandable radial force. They are higher the radial force than the, the other uh, ultra. For the rigid, uh, for the silicon stand, you need the rigid bronchoscope. The rigid bronchoscope is safer and is faster than doing it with the intubated and flexible bronchoscope. But I uh, uh, understand that it can be a, a convenience for some countries. There are differences in the, the ratio of in and out uh, diameter. It, uh, it's an added value because it favors uh, metallic stands. 
as far as the silicon stands, they are not preloaded. So sometimes there are some difficulties you need to, to make some uh, force and to, uh, to put it in your uh, loader. But on the other hand, and but it's more and more important that it's easy to reposition. And what is even more important, it's very easy to remove. For a guidance for the metallic metal stands is very convenient uh, because you do the deployment uh, under direct vision. So it gives you, so, gives you some power that uh, with the silicon stands you don't have. I have to mention also the length to diameter uh, ratio or the relation. Um, there are two kinds of uh, uh, metal stands, the monofilament stands and, and those that are not doing one with monofilament. What does it mean? With a silicon stand, we you always have the same measure in the box and in the patient. While the monofilament uh, metal stands, when they, they are deployed, they are, they are compressed. So in case you don't have a fully fully deployment, then what it happens is that the, the length is longer than you think. This uh, properties is very interesting when you're doing this conical stenosis, but it's going to be longer. If it's, it's less the diameter, the longer it becomes. So uh, you have to calculate these changes. Uh, another difference is that silicon stand uh, lets you have this on-site customization in length, but also these uh, lateral uh, windows. And well, what about complications? Uh, probably we all uh, agree that uh, both stands have a lot of complications. Mycostasis and granuloma in growth, they are universal. So really still a problem of its first generation of tracheobronchial stands. It has been published here. Well, this is a worldwide survey where you can see that at the end, half of the, the um, respondents use silicon and half the respondents metal stands. Mm -hmm. If we just added uh, the white stands and uh, uncover it for it's 50-50. This has uh, some um, differences in, with, with, between countries for those that can use the um, easily the rigid scope they are using silicon stands. The other have to adapt their um, legal um, limitations. In this survey, it uh, is curious that there is a, a question dedicated to how to manage the mucus plaque. So it's really um, it's a kind of uh, of um, information saying that it's really a, a complication that it's important for all of us. Another paper is uh, the description of the safety and efficacy of bonus stand, another uh, fully covered metal stands. And as you can see, uh, after one month, half of the patients have some kind of complications. So again, uh, complications are really, really frequent. And uh, talking about com com complication, uh, where to highlight for uh, concepts? One is how do we detect complication? The other is how we measure them. Third, how do we quantify, quantify them a long time? And the last is how do we measure clinical consequences of, of complications? So when we talk about complications, we should consider them all. For instance, for the first question, how we detect complication? Well, uh, we can just wait until the, the patient has uh, uh, symptoms, which sometimes um, this is an emergency consultation, and sometimes it's done under a conditions and by people that uh, maybe don't know the, the patient. So sometimes to assess a complication under these conditions is difficult. On the other side, can plan schedule bronchoscopy, flexor bronchoscopy, so CT. This can um, induce us a uh, lead time bias, so that's the way that you, you are seeing the complication more time. Or on the other hand, you can have over-diagnosis and, and over-treatment. So um, these are also to be considered. 
it's as in the end it's like the lung cancer or just you see the lung cancer when it's uh, or, or a big tumor or then you do this screening and then you have this uh, biases all has to be considered the second point you have how do we measure complication well again uh, when the symptoms to these uh, complications and then how do we have a objective measure of a complication we need to have fever do we have a pump uh, Doctor, do we have a, a microscopic image or a, a CT image? So we need to measure them and then to compare. And also, not all the applications are similar. Some of them are easy to solve, others are very difficult. Could be this uh, taken into account? The third is how do we express that data? And seeing the papers, many of them are only frequency, but probably, and after the uh, Dr. Oz paper in test, probably there are other ways of um, looking at uh, complications. One is incidence, cumulative incidence, and incidence rate, and we would like to uh, introduce the mortality adjusted complication. What does it mean? Well, you have the patient, you have a cohort of patients that. Um, progressed a long time, but we're talking about uh, malignant conditions, so they die. So your cohort is, is getting smaller and the probability changes. So taking uh, mortality as a competitive risk is also important. Uh, another question is, how do we measure? We have this mucostasis, granuloma, migration, then this cover detachment, and they have consequences big of dyspnea amortizes but when you consider complications what do we have to describe all of them symptoms and symptoms or more robust that are that number of deaths on or changes in quality of life also should be considered in a way so far there are very few comparative studies between stents and um, this one in the 90s, just comparing two metallic metal stands. There's another at the beginning of the century, comparing two silicon stands for benign. And then this this uh, this uh, paper from David Oz that is a full analysis of different uh, stands, and you can really have uh, good uh, good numbers from of them of each each of them, and it's also from Maling. So at that point, we we want to compare the Dumont gold standard stand against uh, Leuven stands that for us is the, the evolution of the metals, the, the, the metal stand, the fully covered metal stands monofilament. For those, we, we have this uh, retros retrospective cohort, which is not considered benign or fistulas, only took malignant, and uh, we use only those patients that we have uh, a flexual bronchoscope as a follow up. So, at the end, we have this 39 patients for with him on and 46 life and stands. Follow up, as, as, um, as I said, was done with a plan uh, flexual bronchoscopy at month one, three, and six, and whenever a complication occurred, for sure. And complications were defined. As micro retention, we classify them into mild, moderate, and severe according to the quantity, the density, and the, the way we clean them up. It, if it's just uh, using saline, it's easy with a flexible, moderate, maybe you need some uh, warm saline or me mechanical, mechanical removal with a flexible, or severe when we, you, we need to use a rigid bronchoscope because they were. Really thick, and then you was we need to use the the suction the suction catheter or even the the rigid bronch to take them out. And then um, we also considered granuloma for any inflammatory tissue that was reducing the stents lumen. And finally, migration uh, when we just observe uh, stent displacement of at least five millimeters. There are the two groups, uh, as you can see. The patient with demon and the patient with Lothian stand, they are similar in age, smoking status, uh, the lung cancer, the stability of this lung cancer, the stage, and the point the patient were. So 
were additional or were not recurrent. The only variable that was different was uh, sex, gender, that we use uh, mostly life and stands in females, probably for the ratio, the inner and outer diameter. Also, the number of stands and the location of the stands were similar as for the straight versus uh, bifurcated and then also for the location. So those, both groups were similar also at that point. As far as efficacy, um, that's, that's true that it was a, not a, um, in, an intent, an intent to treat uh, studies. So all the patients were considered and previously, and uh, we were success in all of them. We are at least 80% of the lumen uh, reopened. And we, we just tag this uh, with an X-ray uh, during the first 24 hours just to see if they are open and in case of a uh, uh, telectasis was the telectasis was reopened and then okay we go to total complications see these are expressed as accumulating incidents and also how they fast appear for mucus retention you see that uh, about 50 uh, 75% and 84% of the patient had the kind of meter retention, a great majority of there were mild and only 10%, 5%, 5% were severe. There were no differences for this uh, viral is Granulation tissue was less, it was uh, about 50% in demand and 41%. There's no differences. And you see that they appear after the median time of uh, micro retention. It was 1.1 and it was 1.4, 1.1 and 1.4. As far as migration, is around 10% in both groups, similar, no differences. And the median time was longer. So when they appear, in general, they are uh, more, uh, they appear later than the others. And finally, and the silicon detachment of perforation of the metal stands were only um, applicable for the aloe stand and appear uh, more than two months after the implantation. Then if we express complications as a function of time. We see that, um, for instance, at first month is around 30 to 40% in both stands, and at month three, it's around. 80 to 90 percent. If we compare in raw data, there were uh, more complications in uh, Leuvenstein, but then we made adjustments for the more robust variables, and then also uh, as a risk analysis as a uh, competing event, and then this adjusted hazard ratio, ratio was not different. So taking all this consideration, at, at this was a retrospective cohort, at the end, there were no differences in the global, in the overall complication. But if we went to uh, one per one complications, we see that for adjusted hazard ratio was against a life extent and human war had meant uh, lower mucus retention. And granulation tissue a long time was similar and also for migration. But uh, what we have in our daily practice, well, and what we see is that we have mucus retention, also granulation and migration. So we are talking in month two, our patients have all these complications all together. So this is a global overview of what can we expect of both kind of uh, stands. So in summary, say that, um, of tens were effective in restoring uh, patency. The probability of presenting any complication increases continuously over time, and we can reach 80 to 90% at three months for both tens. Elapsed time and the probability of the first event, the first complication, differs from one to another, being mucostasis the, the first that counts and it's uh, the most common of them. If we compare both stands, uh, we see that in global, they are similar, but uh, if we go one per one, probably mucus uh, retention, mucostasis is higher in the uh, uh, life stands. And finally, we think, we wish 
that the second generation of Turkey bronchial stents should be should reduce the number and the cumulative incidence of COVID. We are waiting for this uh, uh, new second generation. As you see, the first generation was marked by Dumont stand that we still consider a gold standard, and we can say today that's not been um, it's not uh, any other superior stands nowadays. Thank you so much for your time and uh, attention. Uh, thank you, Tony, for this uh, really excellent lecture. It's uh, only showing to us uh, how silicon stents are universal and uh, practically future-proof devices. And speaking about the future, how the future of stenting will look like. Facts and our knowledge are changing fast as our daily practice. Lessons from the present and a glimpse to the future will be the subject of the lecture of one of the leading innovators in the field. I have the honor to present Dr. Thomas Gildea from Cleveland Clinic. All right, so thank you very much. Let me just get a chance to get my screen shared properly. And let's see. All right, do you see my Primary slide? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So uh, to start off, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here this morning. And I also thank you for the opportunity to have the chance to be on this panel with my hero and mentor, Dr. Mehta, who will be speaking a little bit later. And, and I share the warmth and enthusiasm to be uh, here with my mentor, just as Irve was, uh, had the opportunity to share his experience with his mentor. And so uh, I thank you all for the opportunity. Uh, I do have a disclosure. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic and the institutional officers and leaders um, own the company that uh, owns the device that I have invented with regard to the 3D printing and airway stent that I'm going to be talking about. And part of this was funded by an NIH grant. So uh, with that, I'll just uh, begin. Uh, and, and certainly it's very important to point out that this lecture is going to be very truncated. Uh, I'm really going to be talking mostly about 3D printing uh, and probably the best paper that's been written in a number of years and certainly the most topical, uh, uh, Hervé and several others, including uh, Nicholas here. Uh, this paper in Respirology just recently published uh, covers a lot of the things that are going on. Uh, certainly not only the 3D printing and the uh, bespoke stent, as they call it, or the patient-specific stent, but also talks uh, quite in some detail about coatings and other sorts of technology. So this is a must-read, particularly around this topic. And so I, I encourage you all to find this reference and, and read it. It's very, very good. And so as we heard earlier that the ideal stent doesn't exist, and certainly the opportunity to prevent stenting at all costs is really what we're trying to uh, achieve. However, when we, every talk I give around stenting, I start with this slide recognizing that over the last 30 years, we've been trying to find different variations on stent design that solves a number of problems that make them uh, important to be easy to place and remove. They have to be durable, resistant to, to infection and biofilm, as we just uh, talked about. They come in infinite numbers of shapes and sizes or be able to be modified as such, move air and mucus, not migrate, be inert to tissue and effective granulation, be very inexpensive for worldwide use, and of course, make the patient better. Now, I've been working on this a number of ways, and we've seen this work originally came out of uh, Dumont's work. The very, very first paper spoke to how uh, the stent was modified or cut, and certainly side windows were made. And then, of course, at the last World Congress in 2018, the uh, winning video was around the Dr. Miyazawa's work and how to modify. And I've been doing similar work over years, uh, using stent materials to customize, uh, as I call it, building stents, sewing into different configurations, and of course, using different Dumont or different stent products and, and different materials to achieve different results. And you can see that even in some of these pictures here, this is a stiffer, uh, a Novatech stent product versus a softer uh, stent product. Although they're both Dumont stents, even within silicon products, you can have different stent uh, uh, material properties that you can have softer stents and stiffer stents. 
and then learn to sew them into different configurations. So I am not a surgeon, don't claim to be, but I did learn to do different stitching techniques to, to close off uh, stents for BB fistulas, open windows for side branches, and then create somewhat intricate designs to achieve different results, including scents like this, where this is a very soft, flexible stent with a stiff uh, arm here. And although this was uh, fairly effective in, in the early stages, it still did create lots of problems as one might imagine. And so early on, we read uh, articles such as this, where we looked at the possibility of three-dimensional printing. Uh, this is one of the first papers by one of my colleagues, uh, George Chang, looking at off the shelf uh, software. This is 3D Slicer. And this was one of the first papers describing the possibility of these tools. Uh, we were already very comfortable with three-dimensional reconstructions of airways. Certainly in 2004, we were comfortable with the idea of 3D reconstructions for navigational bronchoscopy, another passion of mine. And learning to be comfortable with multi-planar image reconstructions and 3D uh, airway reconstructions, it became only obvious that this kind of technology may be useful for therapeutic indications. And so uh, this was one of the first papers in this, in this uh, field, but it's been something we've been thinking about for quite some time and then wondering how we can start to transition this. So this, this is a mock-up of one of the products. Uh, we had done some similar work just making airway models or just making anatomic models and then thinking about how to turn this into a prosthesis. And so our first steps were similar to that. We uh, wrote this up in some of our Cleveland Clinic um, marketing work and some of our preclinical data. We were printing uh, anatomic models just to sort of understand in our educational role, like what airways look like and what a normal airway looks like. You know, almost immediately we knew that the left main stem is not a straight branch. It's not a straight structure. And patients, you know, uh, very commonly do not have a straight left main stem. And so we've always known that this was a challenge, particularly around the idea of Y stents. And almost every Y stent sold in the United States is designed to be cut. And so thinking about how one would make a stent, you know, gets down to the construct of how we're going to make a custom product. And so you can't directly print silicone. Uh, it's not a polymer, it's an elastomer, it's meaning it requires a curing process. And we didn't really have a process in mind to directly 3D print materials that was gonna be quickly approvable through a regulatory structure. We started thinking about how we're gonna use silicone and this was the idea. We would be able to very easily print a mold and then have a mandrel and then pressure and direct medical grade silicone. And so this was the process we came up with. We figured this was probably the easiest way to get through regulatory structures. We have 30 years of files uh, with the FDA regarding silicone stents and certainly getting really into the details of Dumont's work with the migration studs and, and how this works just seemed the most obvious thing to do. And, you know, like Dr. Med always told me, everything the old is new again. And so, you know, it just was obvious. We, we go back to the masters, go back to the geniuses and see if we could just make slight improvements on what is already known to be very effective. And so here we are, we started looking at extraordinarily complicated airways. And so this is an individual with severe tracheobronchomalacia. This person had bronchiectasis as the nature of this disease. And so we thought about what would it look like to print this airway? And then what would a stent look like for that airway? And so just an example, this person had a flattened trachea, and if I were to make a Y stent for this, I would make something tubular, or I would make this main stem, and you could say that this stent in the, doesn't exist in the market, and so what would it look like? And then so this was sort of the idea, but this is a material that would not be implantable. This is a more plastic-like polymer, and so just the concept was, can I print this airway, and then what would I design for it, and then using a software package to try to come up with how that would work. And so we started a collaboration with Customized Orthopedic Solutions. It was a company out of the Cleveland Clinic. They were working on shoulders. We developed a software package. We generated a three-dimensional prescription. We worked uh, on silicone molding techniques and then silicone manufacturing, uh, the heat curing process and all the regulatory structures. And that was what led to our NIH grant back in 2014. And so again, this is an example, the first in human study, uh, first in human case uh, reported at the World Congress in 2016. This was the stent that I had uh, implanted in this patient. This individual is having stent replacements every 42 days. He was an individual with Wegener's. I don't know why this is happening. Wegener's. Uh, and I tried to put a soft stent here for the Malaysia, a stiffer stent in here for stenosis, so the window to the upper division. And he's still having exuberant granulation tissue. Uh, and so uh, we put this stent in, and, and then nevertheless, we were just failing. 
So we got uh, FDA compassionate use uh, to put this in there and we reported this case at the World Congress. At the same time, um, uh, the French group in Toulouse was doing their work uh, and actually doing almost the exact same thing, uh, except they were doing a little differently. They were matching up the airway, you know, the airway disease relative to the airway. They were using the same uh, construct of using the three-dimensional airway reconstruction and then basically making a negative of the airway and then molding out that silicone. And they republished their data in the uh, Blue Journal uh, based on some case. And this was a transplant patient with a very complex stenosis. So the same work was being done around the work and that was very uh, uh, exciting to us because that probably meant that we were on the right path. And so this is the publication that we had in 2018. We waited a, a full two years before publishing because I really wanted to make sure that the patient did well. And so this is the case. This is a, a tight left, uh, left main stem stenosis. You can see the airway reconstruction. This was the stent that was in place. You can see the distal airway was very, very tight. We designed this stent. This was the three-dimensional prescription. This is what the stent looked like upon placement. And this is what the stent looked like at 13 months. So this was a patient having a stent every 40 days. And then this is the stent at over 400 days later with only this small amount of granulation here and almost no significant secretions. And the process was pretty much as described. We had an airway, three-dimensional reconstruction, uh, airway segmentation, centerline design. This was the airway uh, package that we designed for uh, making the uh, stent prescription right on the screen. You could just overlay what the uh, stent would look like. This was a process of translating that prescription uh, that we designed here into a CAD design mold. This was the mold, and of course, this was the final product. And it kind of looks a little rough here. Again, this was the first in human, and so their manufacturing has changed a bit in time, but this was the first in human experience, and we published this in 2018 uh, on two patients. Both of them had Wegener's, and both of them had left main stem stenoses. And so again, this is what the stent looked like at 13 months, and you can see before and after. And then after a year, I was able to bring this patient back and then agree to treat both sides. He also had right main stem and right upper lobe stenosis. And I was able to put in a new left main stem uh, stent and then a right main stem stent. You can see a little bit of floppiness here. But I also learned that we could change his prescription. So what's interesting is it wasn't just a change out of the stent, but you can see that after this stent was in a year, this airway started to open up, the inflammation reduced. And so his second stent, I was able to adjust the prescription to open the upper division even more open the lower lobe even more, open up the diameter left main stem entirely, open up the proximal portion. And so there was some evidence that the airway was plastic enough to make adjustments in the prescription and I was able to treat his other side. And so there was a lot of learning happening just among that first year that told us that some things were happening in the airway that were not just obvious. And certainly proof of concept was that this seemed to work at least in this patient. And then we also were had uh, some ability to I get this into some hands of some partners overseas. And so Dr. Schweiger and colleagues in Austria uh, used our design in some patients with severe tracheobronchomalacia. Now that is a much more complicated disease as we all know. This is the individual that they placed a, a couple of stents in, in in Austria and they had already been using this uh, stent design as we all know, and then used our stent product here. And you can see what the three-dimensional airway looked like here. And that went in there. And so it looked pretty good in the initial phases, but like all patients, tracheobronchomalacia, it's, it's a difficult stent. Uh, it did improve symptoms overall, but it's still, you know, a challenging device. And then, of course, the uh, French group came back and started doing the real work that needs to be done. Uh, they started reporting their outcomes uh, on larger group of patients. And again, showing a very similar process that we do. Again, it's a CT scan the same process of uh, digital subtraction, the airway design of the stent prescription for the airway, molding and in, in, uh, uh, injection and implantation. Uh, but then again, they did something that we haven't done yet. They're a little further ahead of us in their, in their process, but they showed their visual designs. They did uh, Y stents, they did simple tubular stents, they did tracheas and main stem bronchi, uh, and they also reported their outcomes, which we have yet to done. But again, they're showing improvements over, over time. They're showing all their um, measurements. And they're also showing something which is, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about is congruence and, and how fit actually occurs. So when we look back at the first Dumont paper, how do you size and how you choose a stent really is, is kind of, you know, more of a, a feel. 
Um, you know, we used to talk about just measuring the airway and sort of by gut, just stuff something in there and, and feel. And so we're trying to be a little bit more scientific when you have these very precise tools. How does one choose the right size when you can make an infinite number of adjustments? Uh, overall, they had 40% complications. Again, looks like a lot less than what uh, Tony just presented with looking at 70% complications. Uh, mucus plugging, migration, uh, one removed for excessive cough. Again, not all stents are perfect. 90% congruence. Again, it's a, it looks like a computer derived outcome. And again, 80% improved, which is what we'd expect to see over relatively short periods of time. So again, the first reported outcomes of these patient specific stents, which again, we're excited about in our group. And it's great to have another a group working on the same thing, again, showing proof of concept across different platforms. And this is again, what our project looks like. This is a airway reconstruction. And this gives us the ability for the physician uh, to three-dimensionally prescribe the stent. And this is just an example of what the software package looks like. And this is just some examples of what the stents and what the complexities of people have designed. Now, this is just some of the examples. Uh, in the United States, we are FDA approved for Y stents only. And there's some, you know, uh, design characteristics around that. But these are tracheal bronchial Y stents, left main stem uh, Y stents, and this is right main stem Y stents. So we, we're all designed for Y stents at the moment. We've had some cases where we've just literally cut off the Y for complex straight you know, airways. But you can see the very complex and very unusual geometries that have been effective in patients that we've treated so far. And I think we're up over 30 or 40 patients uh, treated around the United States in different centers, and hopefully we'll be getting uh, to report some of this data as we collect it. However, there's been some other people in the field. Again, Dr. George Chang has been working on this, and he's been working with his own uh, company that spun out of Duke. And Dr. Maskey is one of my former colleagues, had this patient. This is an individual with a left main stem bronchostenosis after transplantation. And, and those of us who take care of transplant patients know that these are major problems. Not only do they have problems, they have anastomosis, which creates major size mismatches between the graft and the native airway, but there's also going to be malacia that generates on the uh, recipient side and also stenosis that uh, uh, occurs on the graft side. And then you have these dis uh, problems. This individual's lung function was dropping dramatically, was not having good results with existing stents and was headed toward retransplantation. And so he worked with Dr. Cheng's group and this company called Restore 3D to generate this stent prescription. And this was the outcome. And this stent was placed and the person went on to having almost complete uh, normalization of pulmonary function and was able to be taken off the transplant list because he improved his symptoms so much. Now, again, this is a different company. And what's interesting about this, this is direct 3D printing. So this is a, an example of moving beyond silicone and moving into a new uh, material. And this is polyurethane. And so the, 3D, the Restore 3D group uh, is doing this particular kind of process. This is direct 3D printing a novel biomaterial. Uh, and this is just an example of what it looks like. Again, one of the challenges is making a material that is uh, uh, biocompatible enough to be implanted in humans and yet have uh, uh, the flexibility and material properties of an airway stent that can be implanted. And so this company is still under HDE, it's a human device exemption, still being studied. And so we hope to see some really interesting work out of that group as well and, and see what they come up with. And so some of the things we've learned and some of the things that we're looking forward in the future is this concept of plasticity. So you can see here in the first case that we treated that this was the first in human stent and there was a small stent because of the complexity of the airway. And at one year, I was able to make an adjustment in the prescription and open up this guy's airway size. So over a year of, of treating this airway, which was a massive improvement in the symptoms, I saw that his airway on CT got so much bigger from uh, the reduction in inflammation uh, that I was able to change his prescription and his airway just was different. It was uh, improved. So I was able to increase the length uh, and shorten the length in other areas, change the diameters. Uh, and so we did see evidence of plasticity. The airway was changing over time and I was able to adjust the prescription. So there was this concept of plasticity, almost like what we call Invisalign. It's sort of like a, uh, you know, what we make for, for changing people's teeth. And so there is a chance that we may over time be able to mold the airways and, and improve them over some time. And there's some evidence of that. And so there's an example where this paper is in some uh, review right now. And you can see that in among this first patient, this was the first stent we placed. And we have this software now where we can do histograms 
for showing where the stent is sitting. So similar to the French talking about congruence, we're trying to find ways of uh, putting some quantitative science behind it where, where the stent is interacting with the wall and if it's significantly oversized being red or undersized being green, where the contact points are. Again, this is a design stent by the physician versus say the stent that the French do where they're just matching up the airway. If I'm gonna make a prescription adjustment to stretch an airway to overcome a stenosis or just try to match say Malaysia, how good are we at measuring these things and does have an impact? So you can see that we're trying to match up the histogram in some areas. And then this, as the airway started to change, you can see that there were areas where there are gaps versus areas where there was some oversizing where I may have been trying to address some of the stenosis here. And then the third stent, it just looks like we were holding space. It just looked the stent was floating. Then we took this stent out because it looked like maybe we we're gonna do a stent free period and then the airway tightened up a lot. And then we had to put the stent back in similar configuration and the stent was all tightened up. So we could see all this uh, airway um, with a stent was really tight again. And then again, a perfect histogram on the end. So you can see that the airway is plastic. It changes over time. There's an opportunity to adjust prescriptions and looking at trying to predict and understand how these stents interact with the airway. And maybe there's some opportunity to really understand how fit works. And again, similarly on the right stent, right main stem, we can see that when you put the stent in, you can sort of predict whether or not the stent is gonna have pressure points. Um, maybe there's gonna be some impact on tissue dynamics. So all these things we're gonna learn in the future about how stents interact with the airway walls. And if this is gonna have any predictive value related to see tissue granulation effects, migration patterns, uh, probably not mucus really. I think that's more of a material factor, uh, but these are things that we're studying right now and hopefully we'll see some of this in publication in the very near future. And so the future is gonna be, uh, I think, around some of the stuff that you see in the paper that Irve designed, and, but you're gonna see this concept of best fit. So hopefully that we're gonna understand that when you get a stent in there, you're not only gonna have the ability to understand how it fits in the airway just by feel and look, but maybe design it when you're having the ability to look at a CT scan and design the stent as you see how it fits, uh, we're gonna be able to do congruence either by computer generated or by a better understanding it. There's gonna be some opportunity to adjust materials. So we know in our market in the US, for example, there's more than one kind of silicone. And so with the silicone stents that we have in the US, there may be an ability to change silicone products so I can make a silicone that's softer or stiffer or thicker uh, in different areas. And so we can work on those changes in the future. There are novel materials, as I showed. Uh, Dr. Cheng's group is working on direct 3D, print, 3D printing that is non-silicone and maybe some other materials or biocompatible materials that may be more interesting. But there's the ability to do in situ modification. And so in this particular patient, this stent is designed for a patient I just put in a few weeks ago. This is an individual with IgG4 uh, airway disease. And so the stent looks beautiful. So to to echo what uh, Dr. Uh, Duteau said about an airway that looks beautiful, you can see the stent just m um, uh, merges right into the airway perfectly. It just sits beautifully. Uh, but if you don't know where to cut that window for the right upper lobe, uh, it looks kind of strange. So this is when I know where this airway is, I can computer generate where the window should be and mark it on this model. And then of course, the next uh, phase is the drugs and coatings. And that's in the paper that I mentioned from uh, Duteau and colleagues. And so maybe there's a way to look at hydrophilic or hydrophobic coatings, anti-infective coatings, et cetera. And then of course the comparative trials as we saw uh, Tony talk about, those are desperately needed. So with that, I'll stop and uh, return sharing of my screen and, and hope I didn't take up too much of your time. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, really uh, inspiring lecture. Uh, it's good that uh, you show, uh, showed us the way that 3D printing and customization is practically one big part of the future and uh, things you showed actually uh, is uh, that uh, individualized uh, therapy is uh, the key to success. Uh, the individualized uh, stenting, the individualized stent printing is the key to success uh, in our patients. Our next speaker really needs uh, no special introduction. Uh, we know all who Dr. Atul Mehta is, the guru of interventional pulmonology. His work in interventional pulmonology paved the road for uh, many of us. We invite him to share his thoughts about forbearance in endobronchial stenting. 
Thank you, Sposje, for those kind remarks. And uh, what a wonderful talk by Dr. Gilday. Fascinating, fascinating technology. And that is what we need uh, for um, next step in uh, interventional pulmonology. Michael, how can I share? I'm trying to share my slides. Can you see my slides? Yeah, just press hit the the green button. I did and find your slides. Okay, I my yes. Can you see yeah. my slides? Starting. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Tom, thank you very much for your sentiment as well. And this is a truly um, great event, uh, honoring Dr. John Francois Dumont. It is my honor to be speaking at uh, uh, giving a tribute to his very favorite topic on stenting and very fav uh, most favorite technique of his is placing stents in the endobronchial tree. Uh, everybody knows that he is the father and the teacher of interventional pulmonology. And I would like to repeat what Harvey said that he, his tutelage was totally unconditional and he was a consumer teacher. Harvey didn't show my picture, uh, maybe because be this was before Harvey was born, I guess. Uh, I was trained by, uh, by Dumas in 1983. And these are pictures almost some 40 some years ago. I spent three weeks with him. And I still remember, I have fond memories of spending time with him and at his home and having wine from his winery. So uh, once again, I dedicated my, dedicate my talk to Dr. Dumont with great gratitude for my entire career. If Dr. Dumont was alive today, he would have told us that what is the path to the next level in interventional pulmonology. And of course, the technology of just what Dr. Gilday described, that would certainly take us to the next level and something like rigid bron robotic bronchoscopy as well. However, as it has been illustrated before, that we require more randomized trials in um, uh, stenting or all other techniques what we do than just experts' opinion. We need more studies on cost effectiveness than just writing the guidelines on how to do the procedure. And we need to work more on the safety of the procedures than writing consensus statement. We all together needs to re work on reducing the healthcare cost as Harvey and I were talking about just this morning that this technology should be available all over the world, just not in the developed world. In my opinion, reducing healthcare cost is a civic responsibility. And therefore, I would like to talk to you about forbearance with stent procedures. What are the synonyms for the, uh, for the forbearance? Uh, I would also look, look at it as restrainings with stent placement especially by avoidance of iffy indications to replace the stent. And when we have a very high expectations from the stent, of course, you will know that there'll be poor outcome. And that's the way I would like to preclude what I call this thing as failed bronchoscopies or blue bronchoscopies, where the outcomes are much less than what is expected. What are the cardinal rules of interventional pulmonology? A good bronchoscopist is the one who knows when not to perform the procedure. Practicing, per, practicing forbearance will enhance risk-benefit ratio. It would improve patient's welfare and also improve cost effectiveness. And therefore, it is extremely important that we have awareness regarding inexact indication for the stand placement. Why there is leniency with the stents? I mean, we are putting so many stents these days and very many patients walk in with the stent related complication. And the whole idea behind that is there is ease of performance, especially when it comes to metallic stents, they are so easy to place. You know, there is little hesitance in placing those stents because they can be placed with a flexible bronchoscope. 
if cost is not the issue, what I mean by that, if the bills are paid by the insurance companies or uh, the government, then the stents are very freely available. There is a tremendous enthusiasm about doing interventional pulmonology procedures. There are only in United States, there are almost 50 IP fellowship programs. So we are generating more than 50 IP physicians each year in the country. And again, let me give you a perspective of super specialization, such as interventional pulmonology, which is a very tall skill set. However, it is a very narrow skill set, and that is the law of the instrument hammer and nail. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when you have and you're trained in putting the stent, you know, every time you would do bronchoscopy, you may look for indication to some of the procedures. You, knew, you know or interested in. But what I always say that one has to be larger than his or her abilities. Also, there is external factors. Bronchoscopy begets bronchoscopy. And as you will see, already heard that so many times you have to keep on repeating procedures once you place the stent on these patients. And not only that you place, you do bronchoscopies, you have to replace, keep on replacing the stents after stents after stents. And especially that is true when you are treating benign strictures in the airways or in the subglottic trachea. I also feel, and I'm going to be very honest about it, that there is a tremendous pressure from the industry to use their products. I was visiting one country last year before the pandemic, and I saw something which was created wall of fame. If you buy, if you purchase instrument from that particular manufacturer, he would put you on wall of fame of interventional pulmonology. And I think that was a little more than just incentive to use their products. Once again, just to make a point how easy it is, and this ease of technique makes you put more and more stents. You know, this bona stents I'm, you already heard about, the highlighted feature of this bona stent is ability to deliver it to the flexible bronchoscope and you can place 10 millimeter stent, which will fit through 2.8 millimeter channel, or the 12 millimeter stent will fit through 3.2 millimeter channel. Once again, the point I'm trying to make is it is so easy to place this stent, especially with the flexible bronchoscope, and you don't need any IP training to use such products, and therefore, there is always a room for causing problems or complications. One of our old fellows, Dr. Eric Foki, wrote a beautiful review paper in Annals of Cardiothoracic Surgery just a couple of years ago, and he gave a full definition of ideal stent. And let me read this thing to you, and you can read it with me as well. Compromise the lumen. It should be biocompatible. It is non-irritating in all, it available in all necessary sizes and, and it, it, it uh, resists the migration and infection. It could be easily deployed. It could be easily removed and it prevents barrier. It provides barrier to inward growth of tumor or granulation tissue. It's benign, it's, uh, it's being flexible enough to conform to the different luminum irregularities. And all of us know that ideal stand does not exist. So let's overcome that intention. Let's overcome that idea that we can put an ideal stand on a patient. As Dr. Dumont himself said, the best stand is the one which was never placed. And Harvey already mentioned this thing this morning. If it is not properly placed, let me read to you, airway stent could be an iatrogenic foreign body and cause lots of complications. It could also, that treatment could be worse than the disease. Stent should be placed only at the end of the road. And once again, quoting Dr. Eric Folk from that article which he recently wrote, this is the last line of his article which you can see. And at the end, we come to the conclusion that the stent should not be the first line of treatment of choice, but after possibility of curative surgical resection or repair. So stent should be last in the line of your armamentarium when you are dealing with airway problems. This article is from Johns Hopkins. And as you can see here, yes, considering all the minor and major complications, all stents coming along, every all, all stents included 
complication rate is about 69%. I do not have the time to go into each and every complication, but we already heard that number around other articles as well. This is our own data. Dr. Saad and Murthy published this thing several years ago, and they were looking at the glass as if it is half full, but you can also look at it that the glass is half empty. They had no complications in 55 patients or 55% of the patients, but they had complications in 45% of the patients. So this rate of complication is not that small when you consider placing endobronchial stents. Now, there is also very little focus on what leads to complications with the endobronchial stents. And the biggest issue I think in my mind is the lack of precision and Tom, Thomas has very well addressed this particular issue. That if you don't place the stent of the exact size, you are going to cause complications. Undersized stents, obviously it is very easy to understand it is going to migrate. And in my opinion, when you put an oversized stent, it is going to cause significant inflammation and cause lots of granulation tissue. We already heard about the differences between balloon expandable and self-expanding metallic stents, especially related to their length, which changes when you deploy those self-expanding metallic stents, and that may cause problems as well. If you place a stent when there is already mucosal inflammation present, such as Wagner's glomatosis with active Wagner's glomatosis or sarcoidosis or any other inflammatory condition, that is going to lead to significant granulation tissue formation. Subglottic trachea, for an example, is one of the most sensitive areas where you would put a stent and cause lots of granulation tissue. The hard structure of the larynx, for some reason with the reduced blood supply, leads to a lot more complication. And P-tube, therefore, still has got a great value in treating subglottic stenosis. The stents with the sharp end should not be used because they would cause lots of damage to the airways. There is lack of, once again, let me point out that we are very enthusiastic to put the stents in these patients, but there is lack of post-stent care. Patients should be properly instructed in how to take care of the stents they have in their endobronchial tree. Stents should be placed for the least duration of time to prevent airway complication. And occasionally, if you don't have availability of the radiation therapy or brachytherapy, there are articles in the literature that they are still using radiation therapy to treat endobronchial granulation related to the stent. On the left side of the slide, I'm showing you the treatment which is worse than the disease. A metallic stent placed in the subglottic trachea is causing more than 50% obstruction and this should be avoided by all means. I also strongly believe this is, this is the patient Dr. Gilday and I share, and I'll tell you the story about it. You should not place stents if you don't know how to remove them. The stent should be placed only by the physicians who know how to remove them. If you don't have full inventory of the stents, all different sizes and shapes of the stents, I think you should avoid this temptation of putting this device. If the follow-up care is unre un unreliable, what I mean by that, that we put a stent in Cleveland and patient goes to Florida and he's not going to come back to Cleveland Clinic, then th that patient should not be treated with stent because you cannot provide proper follow-up to, to this patient. When I read that the patient was lost for follow-up after stent placement, that patient should not be eliminated from your study or from your data that should be considered as mortality, as patient might have gone home and died as a result of airway obstruction. So you have to pay great attention to the studies which include loss for follow-up. That was not a good proper patient selection. And you should not be doing stent placement if you don't have thoracic surgery, anesthesiology, or interventional radiology back, backup or ENT backup. And this particular patient is a lung transplant patient, had severe stenosis in his right main bronchus. And he developed bleeding during dilatation before the stent placement. And he had exsanguination. Our radiology department was so uh, promptly available that they placed this coil in the pulmonary artery to save this patient's life. Otherwise he would have died at that particular moment. So as Dr. Freitag, the master of stents, he says, 
avoid the lure and the stent infatuation. So this is not the device that should be your first choice. Some of you know the game of cricket. I'm sure you do. It's my, my most favorite game. And there are teams, they play with only one bat. They have only one bat to play. But if you have all different types of bats available to you, of course, you can score better. What I'm trying to say is that you have to have state-of-the-art inventory before you jump into placing stents in your patient. It is not just give me a stent, whatever you have available, that is going to lead to disastrous outcome. This particular slide in the middle shows a stent which looks very nice, but actually that's a very large stent for the airway obstruction. Eventually it is going to cause significant granulation tissue or migration. So you have to have proper sizing. The precision is extremely important and hence avoid the temptation, hence practice the forbearance with uh, metallic stents. As Tom already mentioned to this thing, I am very fond of this particular quote though is that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Pama stent, for an example, is very, very old stent. It's a balloon expandable stent and its complications are very well known in pediatric population. And I, when I read the low bar stenting, people are still using Pama stent to overcome this problem. But knowing the complication is extremely important. So knowing the past is very, very important before you jump into stent technology, that what are the complications and what are the factors which leads to complication. Let me briefly touch upon the post stent management. You know, every patient who has got a stent in the airway should have a stent card. This is from Dr. Tremblay's in Canada, from his program that they give this card to every patient who has got a stent, just in case patient ends up in the emergency room, other physicians know what is going on in his endobronchial tree. Every patient should be treated with antitussives, humidification of the airways, and nebulized medications, bronchodilators, antibiotics, antifiber, and antifungal, and mucolytics as needed in this particular patients. Oral mucolytics may also help, such as guafenacin, such as oral uh, acetylcysteine. Patients should be closely followed. Um, at uh, Peter Boisel, uh, Philip Boisel very clearly showed that CT scan of the chest is 100% sensitive in detecting stent-related complications. So that should be used whenever necessary and bronch should be performed. What I'm trying to say that you cannot just place the stent and let the patient go free. You should follow, follow these patients ext extremely closely. Otherwise, you should not be pay for putting the stents. What are the inexact indication to put stents in my opinion? Putting self-expanding metallic stents in benign stenosis. Yes, there are trials. Yes, there is good results, almost 40% outcome, good outcomes, but these are placed by ex uh, experts who have been dealing with stent technology for years. They closely follow the patients and um, it is placed only after all available options are exhausted. Placing stent following every laser photoresection, I think that is not necessary. When you have an outcome as good as it is shown on the left side of the slide, there is no need to put a stent after every laser photoresection. Unless you have obstruction more than 50% after your procedure, even after doing debulking of the endobronchial lesion, then you may consider placing stent on these patients. I've seen articles placing stent in fibrosing mediastinitis. It's going to fail. Excessive dynamic airway collapse. I'm going to show you some examples. Dual stenting, especially in patients with TE fistula, when you put a self-expanding metallic stent on self-expanding metallic stent, you are going to enlarge the fistula. Be very careful when you put a stent in a single lung transplant patient. If there is a complication, that patient could die. munier kuhn syndrome and lobar pathology are some of the inexact indication for stenting. All of you know, all of you have heard about it, subglottic stenosis, as you see it right here. Unco this is uncovered metallic stent. The, this, uh, the treatment is going to be worse than the disease. It's going to be extremely difficult to remove such stent and the temptation should be avoided. Subglottic stenosis, benign tracheal stenosis, concentric stenosis should be treated with laser photoresection in this particular fashion and balloon dilatation or rigid bronchoscope dilatation and temptation to put stent should be avoided. This was probably the most important indication that you heard about the FDA black boxing uh, metallic stents 
for subglottic stenosis. I don't have time to take you through the entire details of that, but they clearly state that that stent should be placed only after all possible options, such as tracheal procedures or silicon stents have been tried, then only metallic stent, be put, the stent should be placed in this situation. Fibrosing mediastinitis, this is how it looks on the CAT scan. It is a rock hard obstruction. You can dilate it and you cannot uh, make it a flexible kind of an airway with this. If you put a stent in this situation, silicon stent is going to migrate, metallic stent is going to cause exuberant granulation tissue. And once again, the treatment is going to be worse than the disease. As you all know that fibrosing mediastinitis is an inflammatory sequelae of histoplasmosis, TB, syphilis, sometimes from lymphoma, sarcoidosis, or it could be idiopathic in nature. You should not even do transbronchial needle aspiration because only thing it is going to show inflammation and it is not going to show the pathology or the diagnosis of fibrosing mediastinitis. As I mentioned, if you place a stent, either it's going to migrate or it is going to cause granulomas. In only indication for bronchoscopy in fibrosing mediastinitis is that if patient is suffering with hemoptysis, which could be either from the bronchial veins or bronchial arteries, you can consider cryospray or cryotherapy for this patient. Very interesting disease, very interesting condition, I should say, uh, that is that of excessive dynamic airway collapse. And in my opinion, this particular condition also does not require any kind of stenting in the airway. And let me give you just simple example. The re reason for that you do not want to put stent in excessive dynamic airway collapse is because EDAC is a disease of the small airways. The flow volume loop on the left side of the slide is showing inflection point and the patient has got severe excessive dynamic collapse. This patient undergoes bilateral sequential lung transplantation and his excessive dynamic airway collapse is completely resolved. That proves that excessive dynamic collapse is a result of increased transpulmonic pressure compressing the airways and stenting this thing is only thing it is going to do as Dr. Miyazawa has said, that it is going to move the choke point distally or proximally and these patients are not going to fare well with stent placement. Dr. Gilday's paper on dehiscence, yes, you can use metallic stent to cause exuberant granulation tissue to treat dehiscence in lung transplant patient. As you see here, this patient would have died that particular day if the stent would not have been placed. However, look at, the, look at this uh, recommendation by Dr. Gilday that it should, be, it should be only temporary placement. You cannot leave that stent permanently in that particular location. Every few weeks, you have to change that stand before it gets granulated. And the reason I bring out this particular point is we are doing more and more lung transplantations all over the world. More than 4,000 per year in United States. There are more than 80,000 or close to 100,000 lung transplantations have already been performed all over the world. There are over 10,000 lung transplant patients alive in the United States and anywhere between five to 15% of them develop airway complications. With the LAS system, what we use in United States, we are transplanting sicker and sicker patients. We are transplanting patients off the mechanical ventilation of ECMO. And now we are also transplanting patients with COVID-19 after they are cured of their infection. We are also using donors who, to, who have been cured of COVID-19. What I'm trying to say that we are doing a lot more transplantation. It is very, very tempting to put stents in these patients when they develop complication. And so I would like to bring out that particular point. So um, that is, that's what the problem is. We are doing retransplantation and we are doing transplantation the third time. So all these patients are at a high risk of developing airway complications. And uh, that is the reason I would like to, we are doing increased risk donors and uh, they have reduced perfusion and they could have a problem. Once again, this is from Dr. Gilday's paper and which it clearly showed that if you leave the stent in there for a long period of time, you can see the stent eroding on the left side, the stent is see that the stent is eroding into the pulmonary artery and indeed this patient died of exsanguination. Actually in his paper, there are total five, five deaths 
as a result of placing this, keeping the stent in the airway for a very long period of time. Not point, stent on stent, dual stenting for tracheoesophageal fistula. It's still today in this particular practice is controversial. There are a variety of stent, compli stent combinations. You put one silicon stent, and in metallic stent, the two radial forces working in opposite direction is going to make the TE fistula worse. If you want to know, there's no improve. This is Felix Hertz study. He showed there is no improvement in the survival between the dual stenting versus single stenting. The survival is exactly same in this. This complication by aging the size of the previous stent using static balloon, that there is no pressure on either the trachea or on the left or right main bronchi when you put an esophageal stent, so that you do not need dual stenting in this situation. Look at Harvey. This is Munier Kuhn syndrome. It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense to me that somebody trying to put a stent in a patient with Munier Kuhn syndrome. Not only that, they try to put an esophageal stent because esophageal stents are larger, it is going to cause more trauma to the endobronchial tree. And by all means, such things should be avoided by the interventional pulmonologist. And the last point I would like to bring out, this is from our own institution, Dr. Sethi, published the first article on low bar stenting, especially in patients with lung transplantation. And I compliment her for publishing this particular article and her experience. Most of these patients, as you know, are probably vascular stents, and two most popular stents for the low bar stenting are the ICAS stenting and SILMET stents. But there is a beautiful, beautiful editorial by my friend, Dr. Wesley Shepard, uh, in the same issue where Dr. Sonali published her experience. And he wrote exactly the same thing what I'm talking about. Proceed with caution, forbearance, with endobronchial stenting. And he gave a tribute also in his article to Dr. Jean-Francois Dumas when he wrote that editorial, knowing his views that you want to do everything properly and not just to increase the number of stent placed. There are other low bar stents, Aero Mini stents, Fluency Plus stent, and smart control stents available in the, in, in, in the, in the market. These are the three articles which I could find in the literature. Dr. Sethi's data, look at it, 38 patients required 122 stents. And again, look at the very important number out of 122 stents, 71 stents were replaced that are included in 122 stents. And 42% of the patients in year 19, in year 2018, 42% of the patients developed stent related complications. Adnan Majid from Boston, he put low bar stents in uh, 21 stents in 18 patients and required removal of 24 stents because of the migration, granulation tissue, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a, the third study is from University of Pennsylvania and look at their statement. Patients with distal airway stenosis treated with endobronchial stenting neither require less intervention nor have greater financial, great, greater final patency compared with non-stented patients especially in lung transplant group. And one of the biggest complications as I see it, that if the stent migrates distally, you won't be able to see that stent if you want to remove it, fluoroscopy is required to gather that particular stent. And Harvey, I'm not a very religious person, but once in a while I read religious books. And this is what I found in Old Testament. Whom God wants to punish gives into the hands of the physician. This is what you want to remember. And there is no disease is too small that a doctor may not lead to that, okay? So be very, very careful. This is my last slide in my every lecture. A good bronchoscopist is the one who knows when not to perform a bronchoscopy. Complications are frequent when you take leniency or iffy procedure when you perform. No procedure should be performed just to maintain skills. I have to do 200 rigid bronchoscopy, so I'm gonna do rigid bronchoscopy that's not the indication to do this. 
reducing healthcare costs is a civic responsibility. There is only one thing which is as certain as sun and the moon in the sky that we all are going to be patient one day. We have to be larger than our abilities. You want to treat everyone the way you want to be treated. Be a champion, be a champion for your patients, not for the procedure. And most important thing is first do no harm. As Auguste Schommel mentioned, you know, remember no, no, sir. I hope I made my point. Thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mehta, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, this lecture is one of your lectures, uh, like back to basics and common sense. Uh, I always enjoy. And uh, now we are now open for uh, questions, uh, for comments to all uh, our lecturers from the uh, votes from. You can ask questions uh, either here in Zoom application or either via YouTube, and these questions will be forwarded to our lecturers. Uh, well, well, let's start uh, with the first lecture for Herb. Uh, over these uh, 20 years of experience in education, how have uh, trainees and training techniques changed in rigid bronchoscopy and stenting? Herb, that question for you. You, you have to unmute yourself. Can you repeat the question? I, I couldn't hear. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, oh, yes, of course. Over uh, your 20 years of experience in education, how uh, have trainees and training techniques uh, changed in rigid bronchoscopy and stenting? Uh, to be honest- Harvey can take that question, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To, be honest, to be honest, not that much. Not that much. Uh, if you compare to flexible bronchoscopy, with now you have simulators, you have-, uh, you, you have uh, you have really new technologies before. So, so I mean, trainees can, can train flexible bronchoscopy on, on, on simulators before going to, to patients. It's much more difficult, uh, difficult to do it with rigid. You have, you, have uh, you have bronco boys, you have mannequins, you have this kind of things, but you just can do intubation. You just can do uh, navigation, but, uh, but I mean, Therapeutic acts, it's more difficult to, to, to be trained on simulators. Um, uh, you know, recently, I, I, I don't know if I can say it, I can disclose that, but I had to review a paper uh, from, from, from an American group of four um, training centers in America, and they have done a, a kind of a form, you know, um, a form to, to and to, 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 to score each trainees in rigid intubation and rigid uh, uh, navigation. But, but at the conclusion, they say that uh, we don't score therapeutic acts with the rigid because it's more complicated. And these acts will be done with a flexible broccoscope inserted inside of the, of the rigid. And for me, so, <laughs> there is a big nonsense. It's no sense because the rigid broccoscope is a tool by itself. No, it's not, uh, for me, there is no sense to, 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 to intubate a patient with a rigid and after to use a flexible inside. There is no sense. If you, if you take your rigid scope, you, rigid tube, you have to, to do dilation, you have to do coring, you have to do all these things with a rigid tube and not with a flexible. Even if the flexible is always associated, it can be used alongside, alongside. But, but it's not a tool. I mean, rigid is, is the tool and not, not just an intubation. Uh but, but, and then Absolutely. at the end, the training is, has not really changed since the beginning. Um, uh, training has to start, I beside him, and, and, uh, and we do uh, the procedure with four hands. That's my, my feeling. Thank you. Tom can add and, to this, uh, Tom. Yes, Thomas can course. add to, yeah. Tom, can you add something to this? You know, our, our you know our training hasn't changed much. I mean, we we have limited our 
number of fellows that do rigid bronchoscopy to one, even though we do lots, you know, we only do the rigid when we absolutely necessarily need it. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's something that uh, we work very diligently on to do it appropriately and only when necessary. Um, and we do use the flexible food rigid as, a, as an accessory tool to make sure that you have full control of all aspects of the procedure. But, you know, everybody's right. It's, you know, you use the tool only when necessary and use it to its fullest extent. So it's, it's making sure that you know how to use the tool appropriately and for all its continued, you know, points. Okay, and uh, another question for you, uh, Dr. Gilbert. Uh, it's okay, we have the next generation stents and uh, uh, what about uh, uh, thinking of, of uh, some um, new tools, new modifying tools for uh, insertion of that kind of stent? How uh, easy or difficult it is uh, to insert uh, uh, customized uh, 3D stent deeper in the airways beyond the carina? especially in the bronchus intermedius or left upper and lower bronchi. Uh, do we need to develop uh, new specialized uh, tools for insertion such uh, stents? At this point, no. Um, you know, we designed them to be used with the existing uh, Dumont deploying, uh, loading and deploying system. So they're, they're designed to be loaded and deployed with the existing systems. However, I, I do agree that there probably are some innovations to be made to make it easier, uh, frankly. Uh, the good news is, is that because they, the stent is designed to be absolutely perfectly fitted to the native, you know, to the airway where it's going, uh, once it's in position, it sort of flops in almost perfectly. Uh, it, it, it does fit quite well. The, the times when it does it, it's usually because it's a pretty tight stenosis that you're managing, in which case you do have to uh, fit the stent in. Um, and that can be a challenge around the branches. So just like you, you notice that if you're uh, why stent branches into the right upper lobe, but it's tight there that around that carina that does take a little bit of maneuvering. Um, but it's really just like deploying any silicone stent. If you get it into position and then you have to rotate it around and, and do some maneuvering, it, it is just like any other stent uh, except the side branches. Uh, loading again is, I think that there probably is some ways to do it better. Um, I, I should hope that someday when we are successful enough to find that to be a major problem, we'll find ways to, to load it better. Uh, modifying the stent after the fact, we certainly use the, you know, the Duto hold puncher. Uh, I'd still use that for creating the windows on the side. Um, we hope to make some ways to do that uh, better uh, with the cut punches and maybe even some ways to do some in situ modification. But hopefully, again, if it's designed properly in the front end, there'd be very little need for that. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's plenty of opportunities. It's still very new. So we're, we're hopefully to learn a lot more about that. And if folks uh, start to see ways to make it better. Uh, like anything in this field, uh, there's plenty of opportunities for, for folks to improve it. Uh, I'm certainly not the most brilliant person in the world by any stretch of the imagination. So if somebody has a great idea, by all means, bring it forward and, and uh, we'll adopt it and work on it together. Uh, as we expected, uh, a lot of questions comes from our audience uh, for you. Actually, uh, uh, another important question, uh, uh, Actually, a lot of our colleagues are interested in uh, uh, is the uh, current technology scalable to industry standards or the, uh, let me rephrase, uh, is it possible to order uh, some uh, in some way and send over uh, 3D printed stands at this moment? Um, they're available in the United States. Um, we, we um, I know we can deliver them in the United States through FDA clearance. I, there had been a time in the past where they were available in Europe, but that has not um, that has uh, fallen apart because of some challenges related to the CE mark. I, I don't know what the uh, what the current role is for getting things outside the United States yet. It's still such a small company, but you know, hopefully, we could figure it out. There may be individual circumstances within individual company countries that we can do that, but. Uh, right now, it's only available in the United States, to the best of my knowledge. Um, but if people want to ask questions about that, we can probably connect them with the people in the company that do that. Uh, sir, you? you have something to yeah, say? Yeah. Yes, uh, no, because I can have I have fresh news <laughs> regarding this uh, this question. Um, it's already possible now in France, at least, to 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 ask for three uh, D printed stand. It is. Uh, and um, 
even if it's not, it, it won't be done in a, in a large scale, but it's it's possible. Uh, but it's it's not. I don't know exactly, but it's not seen marked yet. But it's an exception. It's kind of exce exception to 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 the market. Uh, soon, as you mentioned, uh, Nicolas Guibert and the, the team of from Toulouse, and and I want to mention it also because. Because first of all, uh, Nicolas Guibert is a real a smart and nice guy. And secondly, I am originally from Toulouse, so it's my birthplace. So it's, uh, it's also a reason why I'm proud of that. Uh, we are going to launch, uh, to, to start a study, a prospective study, B-centric study, which is called Tatum, Tatum study. Um, Tatum, you know, the, the player of Boston, the Boston Celtics, that's uh, the same name. Tatum. Uh, and so we are going to launch a study, prospective study, uh, Marseille and Toulouse on benign uh, airway obstruction. So it probably was the first step before uh, getting the real C uh, marked approval in France. So it will start very soon. So I think in 2021, it will be available in France. So I mean in Europe too, because Novatec is one of the leading company in uh, airway stenting and is um, everywhere in Europe and in the world. Uh, Toulouse Group is far ahead, certainly far ahead. Uh, Toulouse is far ahead in everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In rugby, uh, maybe. Rugby. Uh, another question to Dr. Rossell, to Tony. Uh, what are the key features for the second generation of stents you mentioned, uh, particularly for benign disease where long term stenting is expected? The question is from Dr. Cardozo from Sao Paulo from Brazil. Uh, unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks. Very nice question. Um, yeah, uh, we're facing uh, two kind of, of uh, new generation. It's uh, one pillar is uh, going to be the 3D printing. So it can adapt geometry. As a matter of fact, what uh, Tom uh, was presenting is a new indication of the uh, old uh, uh, silicon stands or new indication. But at the end, and there are some uh, actions that are not uh, being uh, used, that it's uh, all the pharmaceutical uh, actions, all the uh, treatment with drug eluting stents. Yes. I, think, I think that the second generation should also include this. First, the first part of this drug collection should be to avoid uh, biofilm. And uh, we were exploring with some kind of, uh, of silver that we're covering the inside. We did some. Uh, Preclinical studies, uh, that's true that uh, when we came to the big companies, they thought that it's going to be uh, maybe too expensive to do all the clinical studies and it was aborted. But um, probably going to this avoid uh, complications like a uh, biofilm would be one first step. And then uh, if you think that the, the stand can uh, just elude a drug outside, then for benign, Probably this uh, should be think of this uh, some paclitaxel or other kind of uh, of drugs that can just um, give uh, actions for a very specific. So when you do the the prescription of uh, stents, one should be the, the the shape and the angles and the thing, and the other which uh, drug are you going to implement? And you probably could just use some part of uh, to put uh, some paclitaxel in the in the part of you want. To, to to heal, so yes, I mean second generation is uh, geometric and all the all these uh, mechanical properties, but also drug eluting to prevent complications, and we go far beyond to treat conditions. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, 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 another question for all uh, our lecturers: uh, Are are there any role of stents in uh, bronchomalacia in children? What do you think? It, there has so. been there has been um, anecdotal reports of doing airway stenting in pediatric population. Actually, there is a beautiful case report in New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, to some extent, Dr. Gilday addressed this particular thing with a three D three D printing was done. This was published just about three years ago, where the patient had the left the patient was born with uh, left. Uh, bronchomalacia of the left main bronchus, and uh, they made a 3D printing stent in, in this patient. And uh, 
the stent was left in. It was also bioabsorbable. The stent was left in for about three to four months. And as the baby grew, the tracheomalacia got better and that's how the patient was managed in this particular fashion. So that, that, is, that, is, one, uh, that is one case report in, that, in this fashion. There have been few case reports of PAMA's stent placement for tracheomalacia, but you have to be extremely careful uh, because that can cause major complication. If there is any way to increase the airway pressure, like positive airway pressure, uh, in these kids, you may be able to avoid stenting, what you call it pneumatic stenting. And that we use in adult population quite a lot with uh, trachea Malaysia. Pneumatic stenting with BiPAP or CPAP, that might be beneficial in that situation as well. Yeah, some of the earliest children were ex uh, uh, explanted or uh, implanted uh, splints, bioabsorbable splints that were placed outside the airway. Uh, it was a group from Michigan that did the ENT surgeons. Uh, and, but ideally, you know, children eventually grow out of most of the Malaysia syndromes that they have. So even temporary implants are, are somewhat interesting and useful. Uh, we've been thinking about it for our group, but um, we haven't gotten to the, that, that phase of our uh, explorations yet because just dealing with children is um, certainly not my expertise. And I would wait for someone to come to us to bring that up and, and take that on. It's, it's, it's certainly a, uh, a needed uh, role, but it's a challenge. And I would leave that kind of expertise to the folks who do it professionally. Uh, but yeah, um, I was about to say almost the same as, uh, as Tom. Uh, I haven't done pediatric bronchoscopy for a long time. Even I did at the beginning, but um, there, is, there is a need because, because you know, a lot of questions regarding stenting in this uh, indication. There is a need. and. And there is some publications with biodegradable stents because our colleagues, pediatric colleagues, uh, I mean, they know that uh, kids are growing. So the diameter of the trachea is growing. So they, they have the, um, the idea to place first a stent and then eventually replace the bigger one uh, when, when the kid grows. Uh, I still believe that Malaysia uh, Excessive uh, collapse of the airway is not a good indication for stenting, both in pediatrics and in adults. It's not a good indication, but as we don't have uh, other options except eventually external splinting or or or, or, or CPAP, you no know, uh, pressure. Uh, so there is a need, and we don't have the ideal solution for for this uh, this 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 top, this, uh, this disease. So again, a stent is a palliative option palliative option because there is no medical or surgical option existing to, to, to treat uh, the disease. So it's palliation with stents. Yeah, yeah. but uh, uh, this is still the, the stance in the protocol when you're uh, facing this kind of patients. And uh, I really feel that maybe we should uh, uh, eliminate this because I'm really quite, uh, I would say, um, uh, not convinced of that uh, a uh, patient should receive a stand for this uh, edict and this accumulation. But still, they have they are in the end of the of the. So it's the same like the double standing that uh, that the method was showing. And probably it's, it's all, all these indications should one time disappear. Thank you very much uh, for your answers. And uh, one last question for. Uh, today's webinar is from uh, Dr. Brian Trent from uh, San Diego, and uh, I would uh, like all lecturers to uh, give their opinion. Uh, her, uh, his, uh, his question is actually, tranquil bronchial stents have evolved over time at, at a rapid pace in recent years, from smaller stent sizes to stent materials to 3D printed patients, customized stents, among others. What do you see as the next frontier for tracheal bronchial stents? Question uh, for all. What is the next frontier? What is the next thing we should achieve? Maybe, maybe, maybe next next step will be a, a, a mix between 3D active and biodegradable stents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a mix of that, uh, depending, of course, of the indication, depending. But the mix, a mix between all these new uh, uh, directions. I agree, Tony. 
Yeah, I fully agree. But uh, as I stated before, we should go first to uh, complications. If we just avoid complications, probably it's going to be easier for all. Because the other things, uh, well, okay, you need this, you need that, but uh, we need the best, the, the first uh, uh, indication should be uh, avoid complications. Yeah, I, 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 I fully agree with that. Um, and there is a beautiful editorial by Dr. Ribeiro in Journal of Bronchology where he states uh, health of your airways. And I think prevention is the best treatment and where he refers to increasing use of laryngeal mask airways is going to reduce the complication of trauma, you know, traumatic intubations and stuff like that. Avoiding smoking, early diagnosis of Wagner's granulomatosis, and all these things, all these conditions which involve the airway, you know, and cognizance, and uh, you know, um, uh, that would help you reduce such complications to begin with. At this day and age, one should not have difficulty in making the diagnosis of granulomatosis with polyangiitis before it completely destroys the airway. If we use more and more LMA, I think that would prevent subglottic tracheal stenosis and stuff. It is not going to eliminate it, but reduce numbers so that patients don't require any of these things. So I think we need to read that editorial and work on it to reduce airway complications of everything what we do. And that would help solve lots of problems. Health, health of your airways. I would like to add, to add something also, is that, um, yeah. Prevent some 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 complication. Um, our co surgeon colleagues have improved their techniques. For instance, in lung transplantation, they have they improved their techniques. Their techniques, and you know that now, the uh, bronchial anastomosis now is very close, very very close to the secondary carina, both on the uh, left side and and right side. And doing that, they have reduced about fifty percent of uh, anastomotic complication. That's right. But on the other hand, now the management of uh, this complication is much more challenging for us because we are we have we need bifurcated stents now. So that's why, and I see that Tom is ag agrees on that. And so there is clearly now a, a need for this 3D printed stent. Tom says that they have the approval for bifurcated stent, and and I, I really believe that most of the 3D printed stent we will ask will be bifurcated, a lot of them. They will rarely be uh, tubular, straight. Most of them will be bifurcated, maybe more than bifurcated, <laughs> like W stent, not a Y stent. W stent. So yes, we, we have to reduce uh, the, I mean, we have to prevent, but still we will be there for challenging cases, much more challenging than in the past. I'm hoping someday the stent becomes a uh, treatment you know, that it becomes like a cast or a, a device treatment where if you have a malacious syndrome, you put a stent in that's got a, uh, a hardening agent medical therapy built in, or if you have a stenosis, then it has built in a softening agent or an anti-infect, you know, an anti-fibrotic agent built in, or you've got chronic infection that has an anti-infective agent built in, and that it becomes a temporary mechanical treatment that eventually is removed or bioabsorbed and it's a temporary thing. I, I really think that we should be designing these things to, you know, to be temporary and to put us out of business. I really would love that to be the, the outcome of these devices in the future. Absolutely. And last, okay. last point, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Spazoye, can I add something? Because I, I, I've been asked, what is, if I had to, to keep one lesson of Dr. Dumont, uh, I say something, but I've changed my mind <laughs> after our discussion. For him, placing a stent, above all in benign conditions, was always temporary. He, he, he always kept in mind that the fact that one day he will have to remove it. One day does not mean uh, three months, six months, but one day. For, for one patient, it would be six months. For another one, it will be one, one year. But for another one, maybe three, five, four years. But always keep in mind that you want to remove it. You have to remove it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. 
As an example, uh, I at, when we submitted our FDA approval, we asked the FDA only for one year clearance. We built it specifically into our design that our stents are indicated for one year of use only and they're intended to be removed at one year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, very for good. your Thank you nice so much. lectures. And uh, before the end, I would like to express our gratitude in the name of the webinar team to all lecturers to our audience and to our advisors, uh, whose ideas were of great help in organizing this event, Dr. Jocelyn Panu from Columbus, Ohio, and Dr. Kedar Hibare from Bangalore, India. And thank you, as always, Michael, for technical organization and hosting this webinar. Here I conclude this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank and you so much. Goodbye thank and you. stay healthy.